Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's City Council meeting. It's uh, 7 o'clock, and we've got a very full agenda, so we'll get started. We're going to start with our uh, traditional moment of silent reflection, uh, keeping all of those uh, close and dear to us in our best uh, thoughts, wishes, and prayers. So let's start with that. Thank you very much. And to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening, let's have uh, Angel McCauley and Sam Kramer lead us. How about that? We'll see how synchronized you guys are. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was uh, very deliberately uh, performed. We like it. Okay, first thing we're going to do, we have, uh, for the first time in my tenure as mayor, we have not one but two new city police officers about to be sworn in. And uh, the first person we'll swear in is Angel McCauley. And you brought a couple of special guests this evening. This guy is Aiden, right? And this gal is Kenzie, is that right? You want to come up and uh, help mom with this? And Chief Gregory, would you like to join us up front? You get to you get to be right beside Mom. Right there. How's that? Nah, that's a good that's a good family picture. There. How about that? <laughs> All right. I have the oath that I would ask that you repeat after me. Okay. I, Angel Marie McCauley. I, Angel Marie McCauley. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. The Constitution of the State of West Virginia. The Constitution of the State of West Virginia. The Charter and Ordinances. The Charters and Ordinances. Of the City of Buchanan, West Virginia. Of the City of Buchanan, West Virginia. And faithfully discharge my duties. And faithfully discharge my duties. As a police officer. As a police officer. Of the said city. Of the said city. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. I need you to sign over here, and then we'll be uh, pretty official. How about right there? Please sign it as your name appears, April. Angel April. Happens all the time. Forever known as. <laughs> Kenzie's going to give me a good swift kick. I know you get my mom's angel. Let me sign it out. Let me Congratulations. It's official. Congratulations. So just in time for the Sam Kramer. Yeah. Oh, stay. Are we? Yeah. Yeah. Cheap. Cheap. Photo off. Yeah. They want to take photographs of you. This is going to be the first. Thank you. Thank you. You're not gonna. You're not gonna see. We won't show any piggy toes in these pictures, will we? Thank you. Okay. Katie's turn. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, that's good. That's a great shot. You got good material there, Mark. Congratulations. <laughs> Stick around because we're going to do another one of these and then we'll get some collective shots, all right? I'd next ask that uh, he doesn't go by Donald, but he goes by Samuel Kramer. So Sam, do you want to come up? You're the next. You're the next guy up. And who? And remind us who you have with you. You've got Autumn, got Autumn and Logan. Right. And then I have my sergeant from the jail and his girlfriend as well. That wow, that's a good crowd. That's that's, that's a highly impressive. <laughs> this is Sam Kramer. His full name is Don, Donald Samuel Kramer. Let's. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the oath. Repeat after me. I, Donald Samuel Kramer. I, Donald Samuel Kramer. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution. That, will, that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Of the United States. The Constitution of the State of West Virginia. The Constitution of the State of West Virginia. The Charter and Ordinances. The Charter and Ordinances of the City of Buchanan, West Virginia. Of the City of Buchanan, West Virginia. 
and faithfully discharge my duties and faithfully discharge my duties as a police officer as a police officer of the said city of the said city to the best of my ability to the best of my ability so help me God so help me God I ask you to shine right here and please shine it just as your full name is above Congratulations. It's official, man. Everybody, come on, get in the picture there, Doug, so we can get a nice, uh, nice family shot here. Okay. Are we scrunched in enough? Pretend like we like each other? Turn sideways. One, two, three. Okay. All right. One more. Before we oh, sorry. Thanks. Callie did a couple of shots. Hang in there, Doug. And Angel, would you mind coming up so we could get a combined picture with you and Sam since we've got both of you coming on board at the exact same time. You can squeeze in there and we'll, we'll take a we'll okay. snatch a couple of more. JB's oh. taking pictures in the back. <laughs> Look at me first. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, JB. Look at me first. Oh, sorry. It's all about One, Katie. Two, three. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm Don't worry, I got <laughs> yeah, we'll let Callie snatch a couple of their city websites. Is it the fake press, David? Or what's it's the, the fake news and fake press, that's right. Excuse yeah. me, David Tolman. The Inner Mountain didn't care a lick about us tonight. Oh, She's, no, She's on vacation. Uh, Sarah's on vacation. She is. Well, then we should cancel the meeting. <laughs> there we go. No, that means I get all the scoops. Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. Congratulations again. Talk to me about having people. Okay. Congratulations. You might not be saying that in a month when you're at the police academy. <laughs> yeah. Darn those people, right? Yeah. 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 Congratulations, guys. Yeah. yeah. For those of you who haven't been following this process, it's been a grueling uh, six months to reach this point. Uh, we went through two different applicant pools and finally got uh, a pool of folks certified with their agility stuff and then the written competitive examination and then the interviews. and. Uh, every time we have an opening in civil service, whether it's police or fire, we're talking about a six-month process to replace uh, an officer or a firefighter. Okay, we're ready to move into uh, our guest for the evening. And Tim, did you want to wait and talk when we got down yes. to... And, and uh, Mike, the same thing with you. You want to wait till we get down into the thing? Okay. Um, so, the first guest that we have to be recognized is Brian Shreves, the director of the Upshur County Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Brian, you want to come up and kick it off, and then we'll let Jeff Harvey uh, He just chime. woke him up with me, we're just going to do this together. We're going to do a dog and pony show, yes, frick and frack, peat and repeat, all that good yes, stuff. Sir. Okay, you've got it. Um, I stand second fiddle to lights. <laughs> okay. You were given a copy of what we have discussed as a functional annex for the city of Buckhannon to the Upshur County Emergency Operations Plan, which will allow, in a disaster, the city to obtain resources through the state, through my office, to be able to request them for you. And I know that this was tried a few years ago, and it was not really well received because my predecessors were trying to say that they were going to tell you guys how to run the city. I am not going to tell you how to run your city. All I am is going to be a resource allocator for you. And with this annex, and Jeff can test this, and that's basically what my office is going to be doing for you is allocating resources through the state of West Virginia in a disaster. Okay. And the reason I came to just kind of tack on to that is uh, Chief Gregory and Chief Kimball had, had given me a call whenever we were talking about this to see if it would be uh, an element of or satisfy some of the requirements that they would have through their accreditation processes relative to an all-hazards plan. And this particular document was always written to be an annex to the Upshur County Emergency Operations Plan. So this annex, as well as the remainder of that document, would serve uh, probably fairly well as at least a, uh, the groundwork for uh, an all-hazards plan for their processes. 
So, uh, and certainly some of the benefits here is it uh, just formalizes this process, gets the city at the table, uh, you know, to be able to collectively work with the county on at least some of these issues that are addressed by that. Okay. I can tell you, gentlemen, that the matter was, uh, I wasn't even aware of it being routed to him, but our city engineer, Jay Holland, Yes, I was kind of involved with it. I was on the phone with Jay for about an hour and a half this morning, and we worked on some bugs that were in it. Yeah. And the draft that you have now is the final draft that Jay and I came up with that he felt would be accepted. Okay. Is there, is, it, it, there's no emergency need for us to vote on this tonight. If we take it up at the July 5 meeting, we'd be okay? Absolutely, sir. And that's what Jay and I talked about. To give you guys a chance to look yeah. through it. If you have any questions, you can contact me okay. and we can get through this. And, you know, he'd asked a couple questions about, you know, being a part of the local LEPC. And that would be a good thing for a representative on the city council to be a member of the local emergency planning committee. We meet once a month, either here or in Lewis County. And it just gives you a voice, like Jeff said, at the table to help with the planning in the communities. Sure, sure. Now, there was a plan or proposal a few years back that was, is this modified or is this similar to what was what put we, What I did is I took the plan and the, the wording in there that was put in by my two predecessors ago that was where they were taking charge of everything was taken out. Because I don't know how to run your city, just like nobody would know how to run my office. You guys are the experts of the city, so you guys will run your city and come to me when you need assistance to get through the, through the process. Sure. Let's, uh, let's be sure that all of our players are on board, not to doubt you in the least. But uh, we'll put it on the agenda for the July 5 meeting okay. to consider adoption of this. Okay. And we'll try to move it along as quickly as we can. Okay, like right. I said, I've been working with JB and Matt on this. Sure. And they've both been on board with this also. Sure, sure. We'll, we'll have all of the necessary players review it in advance all right. and try to be in a position to act maturely with it at the July 5 meeting. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Well, Thank we you. have a, a couple of seconds that we're talking about emergency stuff. Just a quick couple of points on a big event that we did a couple of weeks ago here in Upshur County. Sure. Uh, for several years now, uh, emergency services providers as well as uh, county OEM and Upshur County Schools have been working on doing some full-scale exercise and other trainings with some of our school personnel. Uh, on June 2nd, we actually did the first of those at Buchanan Academy, uh, Buchanan Academy Elementary. Uh, it was a full-scale active shooter exercise attended by uh, over 90 folks um, through, throughout Buchanan, Upshur County, some neighboring counties. Uh, we had state agency and federal agency representation in that. Uh, <coughs> proved to be a, a real good, solid event for us. Um, we set it up to be sort of introductory in nature. We wanted to bring all the partners together and get them the opportunity to begin working together. Uh, so we were very successful in that, and we learned a few things that uh, we can plug and play and, and improve the next time we do it. So it was successful in that light, too. Um, and then the final thing I'll say about it, uh, barring any questions, we're just uh, in our debriefing on that, uh, agencies as well as school participants really expressed an interest in getting onto a cycle and, and doing those on a regular basis uh, to be able to help out the preparedness. So it was a great event. Uh, we had excellent city representation from, from the emergency agencies and uh, just wanted you guys to know that. Yeah, so. Thanks. So Thank what you. were your takeaways from that, having done it? <laughs> we, um, oh wow, uh, there were, there were there several. Needs to be, there needs to be better communication with the, some of the other law enforcement agencies and I'll just leave it at that. Um, we didn't have much participation from other than, we had every city officer was there. We didn't have much participation from any other law enforcement agency. State or county? No, ma'am. We had, um, there were some things in terms of, just from an operational standpoint, um, interoperability between the school board and their knowledge of their facilities and things like that and how to transfer that to our emergency services providers. Um, we tried out something new, which was being able to secure sections of the building and start working with the victims of that scenario as quickly as possible. We were pretty successful with that. Uh, we did, of course, learn some communication challenges. That's probably the one you can bet on with every operations mm -hmm. exercise. But our players were, they did admirable with communications, but we learned a, a couple of different ways to utilize systems that we have. Uh, and I think some ways to you know, add and supplement the systems that we have that would make it even more efficient. Uh, and after that, it was just a matter of 
you do these things and you recognize how far you've come, but it's a little, uh, you recognize how far you've got to go. So we have some other sort of fringe processes relative to uh, reunification and things like that that will be a big part of the school-based emergency um, that we need to plug and play into the system soon. I have a question. Mary? Are the um, school board, are they still requiring so many teachers at a school, all schools in Upshur County, to be cert qualified, qualified, go through cert training? It's a, it's an encouragement, but it's not a requirement. Yeah. Um, we've had some folks move around through the system, uh -huh. so we have like big groups at one school, and we're light in another in another school. I think we're big at the high school. We're big at the I, we are big in a couple of schools, okay. but uh, but they're trying to get back to where we get on a, a cycle there, where we've got some refresher, and where we can refresh those that are there and bring some new on. And so I know they're working with Citizen Corps to last, understand that. Last year they were given cert kits. They were, uh, there were some were updated. Yeah, they were some that cert kits updated. that had like, like tourniquets, quick cloth, stuff like that in it for the cert people at the high school. And I can tell you throughout a few of the of the schools, uh, they worked with Upshur County EMS and some other providers on some first aid CPR training in the schools. Um, every year uh, we have a program that's been based on um, several different paradigms for response to active shooter um, that all of our employees have at least been offered to go through. Uh, there's a refresher on that every year, an opportunity for new hires to go through that. Um, so there's lots of different training opportunities they, they sponsor. So how many of our schools, public schools, are in city limits? I mean, it's academy? One. 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 And this, and so all the other, op, you know, options of this happening are in the county and state and there was no participation the middle school and the high school have pretty good representation from the sheriff's de uh, department in the school both the pro officers from there are, are there and they're very active in the planning process um, so and there's just schedules were what got in the way of them being able to the two pro officers to be able to participate in the exercise on the second um, but that's that's the extent of my definitive knowledge there. But the sheriff's department is involved in the process that we have for planning, and uh, and state police has always been involved in that too. We have a countywide safety committee that meets at least once per year. We target that twice per year, once in the fall and once in the spring for upshur schools, and that's got representation by all of our law enforcement um, as well as the marshal service and the FBI. Uh, and then we've got um, our fire service in there, uh, health department, hospitals, Red Cross, Salvation Army, some other support agencies. So in terms of being involved in the process, um, the agencies are at the table. Um, it just, we couldn't get it worked out for that particular exercise on the second. I hope that, um, you know, we can maybe take this on the road and do some you know, middle school, high school, maybe Westland, because I think you'll probably agree one of the best things is learning the floor plans and Absolutely. learning where everything is and the hiding spots and the entrance points and so one school you know it, not it's like a golf course not not a, no two golf courses are the same so no two schools have the same layout or the same places to enter or exit Ben it's interesting there's um, we identified some um, inconsistencies in the existing latest greatest copies of the floor plans um, if you don't know, my company works for the Board of Ed, and, and we've done so for the past several years on emergency preparedness. That's the only reason I know what I know. But um, we found some inconsistencies with the existing floor plan. So last summer and then through this particular school year, my staff and I went through and walked every inch of every school and are redoing all those site plans. Um, those are scheduled to be done in draft form before the start of the 18-19 the, uh, school year. We'll go back through and do a couple of double checks to make sure they're accurate and things like that. But what that'll be nice is we'll have one accurate updated plans, but we'll also have the ability to edit those here locally. So, um, so and, and that's, and locally, I mean at the board office. So anytime we make changes to our facilities, we can do that in-house and we'll be right up to speed there. Um, the cycle of exercises that we want to do, um, we already have um, at least the middle school has volunteered to be the next one that we do an operations-based exercise at, which will probably be in the spring of the next school year. Um, lots of folks within the Board of Ed themselves are talking about how we can <coughs> boost participation from board employees in that process, so lots of, of good energy going on there. But ideally, we want to also plug in and, and have a different school that does a tabletop each fall. So we'll do a tabletop in the fall, an operations-based in the spring, and then the school that does the tabletop in the fall will be the next one up to do the operations-based in the spring. So that'll allow us, it'll take a little bit of time, but it'll allow us to cycle through all of our schools um, test out the response to a bunch of different types of scenarios, be it security or some other type of a hazard, but certainly for all the players to be involved and, and get to know each work with each other. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. 
I mean, right off from the beginning, there is not, and Chief Berger and I have discussed this, there is not a dispatch policy for an active shooter at any school in Upshur County. No, there was not. There right. wasn't as of the time of the drill, but I would say there will be pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I, want, I want the council to think about this. The amount of resources we put on that scene, it was timeline just like it was live. As the call came in, the response times were accurate to what we put out. I want you to think about the response times to our distant community schools yeah. for that same amount of resources. Rock Cave, you're looking at 15 Rock Cave minutes. School to get that much law enforcement, that much emergency medical, and that much fire on the scene to mitigate that situation. You know, you're talking lots of minutes. Well, it's not just the time, it's the actions taken of the people who arrive there first. Yeah, exactly. don't have yes. a strategy or a plan, you know, we've seen in other cases, they arrive, but they, they don't, don't do take it. the no. right action. And you have to think, too, in a situation like that, and we talked about the other day at the office, you have a, uh, something like that at Rock Cave, I can guarantee you there's going to be armed parents on scene before the first law enforcement officer ever hits the door. And that could be a problem, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One question is, are all your county law enforcement, I apologize, are all your county law enforcement agencies uh, armed similarly? Yes. As far, or I, I, I assume. ARs? I, I believe so, yeah. yes. Okay, because the reason, the reason I was saying when I was on the city council in Elkins and I was on the public safety committee, we had 11 officers and three of them brought their own ARs and the rest only had 45s. The county had 40 at ARs, Sheriff's Department, everybody else had ARs except our guys. And you have to take into consideration, these guys know what they're going into and they'll go into it mm -hmm. willingly. But I'm not gonna send one of my guys into a, a rifle fight with a 45 or three max. He doesn't have a chance before he gets into it. So that's what the question I was asking because we armed all of our guys with a tack bag. But, you know, unfortunately people don't like that stuff but you're gonna have the person who's trying to stop it hurt before he even gets a chance if you don't have him similarly armed. And back to the whole map of the schools, and Jeff can verify, through my office I have access to the Homeland, the Homeland Security Information Network, <coughs> which I am on the Safe Schools site, which I can actually get on my computer, and once they're updated, I will be able to pull up any map of any school in Upshur County. And in a, in a disaster, I could actually print those off or I could email them to every officer on their phone. One of the efforts we're trying to do there is years ago, circa 2006, 2008, back in that area, uh, at the beginning of every school, Upshur County Schools would put together what they called a site survey. And that was typically disseminated in paper format, then it went to a you know compact disc. <laughs> but um, what ended up happening is that was updated every year. Well, there was, it was very difficult to control copies. There wasn't a process by which those things were collected back. Um, so data control was a major issue. Well, with the advent of the Homeland Security Information Network that Brian's talking about, um, Jody Akers at Upshur Schools has been working hard to get not only OEM and 911, but each of the agencies that are out in the county access into that too. And there's a pretty significant training process that you've got to go through to be um, uh, credentialed for that system. And uh, that way we can always keep the updated information, even if there's a change made mid-year, anytime you log on to that, you've got the latest and greatest version of all that information in a secure environment. So, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, like I said, a lengthy credentialing process to even get access to that system. So um, we're the only county in the state, so far as I'm aware of, that is trying to go that route. Yeah. Um, and I know our safe schools coordinator in the state office at Charleston likes that approach because, like I said, it's a good way for us to keep sensitive data under wraps, but the people that need it have access to it. So um, a lot of good things going on there in terms of just how we're trying to be progressive with that. And uh, it's good to see that the individual efforts of the county and the city from a response standpoint with what the school district's been doing for the past 12 years uh, start to, to get synced together. So You know, we're all thing. here for the same thing. You know, we can't let boundary lines or geographical lines separate us. We're all here for the protection of the citizens of this community. And it just needs to come down to that. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like we're, Thanks, everyone. we're getting better and by these drills. Also, I want to thank Jeff Harvey. He's uh, been serving on both our police and fire accreditation committees. And a lot of extra time for an already busy guy. We appreciate it. Thank Interesting you. reading, we'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks for what you do. Thank you.
We'll uh, get back to Tim and Mike when we get down to discussion uh, about the residential parking situation on the college. Um, that would take us to our department and board reports. And first up is our uh, grants and information gal, Callie Cronin-Sams. Callie. I feel like it's been a while. <laughs> you weren't at the last meeting, were you? You were at a conference. I was at a conference. That's right. Oh, I thought it was in the conference. That's in Charleston. <laughs> yeah, and I have that on my report as well. Um, you will find your entire report for this evening in your packet. And um, just to start with, under the website and social media, which I generally start out with, the biggest thing there is that I think Andy received an email last Thursday or Friday from Pipewood uh, that gives our web hosting service, letting us know that they will be discontinuing that service as of the 30th of June. So we've kind of been scrambling to find new web hosting service. And um, I think we have a good quote from West Virginia Net, and they'll be able to provide that for just $25 a month. And so um, that's something that we'll be doing over the next week and in order to get to keep our website up and running and shouldn't have any break in service there shouldn't have any downtime with the website um, in addition on the website i've added the google Analyt analytics plugin uh, for wordpress so now i can be keeping track of how many people go to our site what they click on how long they spend on each page within our site that sort of thing so i'll keep an eye on that uh, since last time we've had 15 posts up and um, I've also continued to add maps on um, different pages within the website so that you can see how to get to different things that we talk about on the various websites or pages within our site. Um, let's see on Facebook 16 posts some of the highlights there were uh, the photos that we put up of the preparations and advance of Memorial Day both at Jawbone Park and above um, Hebner uh, Cemetery. And also our water department received a nice award. They were at a conference in Canaan and there was a water testing contest and our water actually, from what I understand, tied for first, but then there was no there was no tie allowed. So I guess we were just barely beat out there. And, uh, I scolded them at the last water board meeting <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> But still some of the best tasting water in the state, as we all know, if you live here, we have some great tasting water um, and dropping down <coughs> what I've been up to also I um, went up to the opioid workshop put on by representative McKinley in Morgantown at WVU School of Law and that was definitely picked up some good information particularly on applying for SAMHSA grants and so that's our substance abuse and mental health associations um, so it's a federal grant program and I did learn quite a bit there uh, then I was down in Charleston the 7th and 8th for another grant writing training that was with Alice Runke and picked up some good information at that one as well. I thought that was worthwhile to go to. Um, happy to talk about any of these in more in depth if you have questions. Uh, then I was at a biomimicry training in Cleveland. That was actually for my master's degree and so that was out of my own um, you know the city did not fund that. That was my own. But I wanted to include that because I am going to try to uh, take what I learned from that course and put it to work here in the city. Um, if you aren't familiar, biomimicry is a field where you're looking at processes in nature and seeing how you can uh, adapt those to um, new innovations and both um, organizational social biomimicry and also inventions themselves. So we kind of have the option with the class I'm in and either presenting and researching a possible innovation or using it as um, a feature in a park or a school or a community or a youth center. So I'm thinking more going that route and it's a good STEM activity that we could uh, feature either at Stockard or maybe one of our parks or a little bit of both. Um, then I was at the Try This conference uh, June 14th and 16th right here at Westland and once again I really felt that was valuable. Um, spent a lot of time chatting with Kent Spellman about uh, trail development and our river walk and uh, some different possibilities for funding there. So that was a highlight I felt for attending that conference. Um, and you just see the press releases that we've had out recently. Uh, of course, we have the Colonial Theater benefit coming up this Saturday. 
um, a light project related to opioid prevention and treatment. And also, of course, today we dedicated our sewer plant to Sam, Sam Ludlow. So I have that draft ready to go out. I just wanted to let Raz and those folks review it first. Um, dropping down to grants, Sarah Campbell with our Buchanan Volunteer Center has been doing a great job. She's already done a marketing plan for the Volunteer Center. And um, we have the, we are in the process of getting our web platform ready to go with Gone With Galaxy Digital, who does the same service for WVU and um, some of the United Ways and some other uh, places here right in West Virginia. So I think that's nice that we might be able to connect with those. Um, she's also been reaching out to a lot of different groups within the community and seeing how they might be able to benefit from the Volunteer Center. Um, let's see. Then we've got the REAP Litter Control Grant. Oops. That's a typo on my on my report. It's the REAP Recycling Grant. So you might want to change that. And further in your packet, you actually have the application itself, so you can see the detail. So I've been working with Jeff Wamsley um, with the Waste Department, of course, and um, he's looking to use funding from that particular grant to purchase a new hook. I mean, I'm gonna have to have this in front of me to get it right. Lift. What's that? Lift. Yeah, help me. Hook, hook lift, lift truck. truck. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So I have that for you to review and a possible vote if you'd like. It's a replacement. We use the same grant like way back in 2006 to get the same piece of equipment. So it's now obviously quite old and it's uh, a little costly to maintain, have to do significant repairs on it quite often. And it's just becoming inefficient to be using that piece of equipment. It would be great if we could get that replaced. Um, Okay, so I have that. It is in your packet, but I'm still adding some more information as I collect it from Jeff and Jerry. So that is due July 1st, though. So if you would like to go ahead and give Jeff and Jerry and I to go ahead on that, you could do that this evening since we don't have another meeting prior to that. Um, so I went ahead, um, decided since they extended the AML pilot deadline that we voted on last meeting, I've taken the opportunity to continue adding some more supporting material to that uh, as far as the economic benefits of trails extensions as well as our community and uh, the expansion we're looking to do there at Stalker. But I'll still get that in. We have a June 29th deadline on that, so that'll still be in by then. Um, Maria Bray forwarded me information about a dog park grant, and it has a deadline of 30th of this month so I let her know just to get uh, back to me with what they're looking to do there from the dog park committee and she had sent that to the rest of the committee and so I'm waiting to hear from them on that uh, the try this grant we'll be working with create Buchanan perhaps on that one that was um, part of the conference if you attend the conference then you are eligible to apply for that but uh, my reading of it, it needs to be a 5013C, so that might be something that we could partner with CREATE on uh, if we want to go ahead and submit for that. That's a small $3,000 grant, but it's for, you know, community activity and wellness, fitness, healthy eating, so definitely might be a good thing that we could use one of our parks or the community garden, something along those lines. Um, I bumped into uh, people for bikes. Uh, grant that might be good for some of our um, the river walk or maybe even doing something with soccer related to bikes. The letter of intent is due on that on, on July 23rd. And um, some folks have forwarded me some information about the substance abuse community plan uh, grant that's available just recently came out. The announcement came out June 15th. And we would need to get in an application for that by the 30th of July. Uh, but that is, they require you to have a consortium. So I'll be reaching out to the Chief, Chief Gregory and Kimball and see if you'd like to take a look at that and see if there's something we could do on that. Um, and I continue to work on, as I was working on that REAP um, recycling grant. I was also working on the uh, equipment needs at the sewer department for the community facilities application. Um, then I just have the events and I have got to apologize to Pam because I, I was in a little bit of a hurry when I typed this up and 
I completely blew right past Fourth of July. So I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, that's a pretty big event. So uh, Fourth of July, add that to the upcoming events as well. In addition to, um, of course, Saturday the theater benefit. Next Friday's the weigh-in, the final weigh-in for Stalker, and. Um, Fourth of July celebration, <laughs> actually on the sixth at, yeah, at Festival Fridays yeah. or following Festival Fridays, and then our Stockard Youth and Community Center Town Hall on July 23rd. And I apologize, I feel like that was really lengthy, but lots of stuff happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Carol? Oh, and you each have in your packet the infographic for the Volunteer Center that Sarah put together. So awesome. Questions for Callie? Thanks, Callie. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Bring us millions of dollars. Yes, yes. Public Works Director Jerry Arnold. Well, I think Callie's from Board of Fill up a slack or anything. You haven't done a darn thing. You haven't done anything. You need to start pulling your weight back, Callie. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I've uh, been working on the theater stage for replacement of the roof support beam over the last couple of weeks. I'll be working on the pavement bid, or paving bid package uh, over the next couple of weeks for the uh, this season. Working with Rob Barber to produce some time for wildfire program. The water department, uh, they continue inspecting on the um, water system improvement project on the Old Western Road and Lagos Vision continue inspection on the third lane project and repairing some lighting in the plant as well as working on uh, parts inventory. Sewer department, the completion of the Swisher Street culvert installation. We're completely out of out and the equipment uh, with the equipment and paving to remain. Hopefully uh, first week weather permitting we'll be paving that. Stormwater on private property, Rex Harris permission has been provided to dig up a section of the 30 plus or minus one line. Trees been cut and the worst part of the uh, corrugated metal pipe section of culvert's been removed. Uh, there's, after this evening's uh, sewer meeting, there's uh, a little more on that issue that, that we'll need to take up later. I think I, I had mentioned last meeting that <coughs> we were really going to have to do some uh, have some discussions about sewer storm sewers on private properties so there'll be more to come on that at least follow um maintenance crews taking in scrap pipe and old metal to the recycling center to clean up the yard for june 21st work on the wood street road repair started anticipate to pour concrete this week uh, we will end apply approximately 100 tons of sludge starting Monday, approximately three to four days of trucking material to site and that's Bill Roar's site. Continue to gather information for our UV upgrade the plant. One unit will cost the sewer department $90,000. Schedule replacement of the second unit in two to three years. Continue to gather information on the inlet bar screens at the Deanville pump station. One of the two will be completed in 18-19 physical year. Waste department, nothing new to report other than than what Callie reported with working on the grant and, and she had mentioned that we bought the used the same grant in two thousand six to buy the same piece of equipment. We used the same grant two thousand or in nineteen ninety eight to buy the same piece of equipment as well. So that grant is uh, typically provides all of our new equipment needs in our recycling program has for several years well, since the since the inception of the program. Um, street department. Uh, we've been working on various maintenance items as well as uh, the crew's been assisting on the theater the last couple of weeks. And as I mentioned, Swisher Street paving next week, weather permitting, they should start the, uh, the grinding necessary to start the paving tomorrow. Uh, and then first of the week, hopefully, we'll get the paving done out there. Engineering, any new, uh, really new facet that I have from JSC conducted the preliminary design review of the Citizens Bank project with our city's project team last week. So that's all I have unless you all have questions. Questions for Jerry? I, twice uh, in the past two weeks I've been on the phone with two different people from out of Buchanan trying to help them navigate around the mess that's up at McDonald's through our side streets. And we are, I was curious to know, is this kind of twofold? So 
how are we coming with our street signs? And if we're still a long way from the nice street signs, can we get a couple replacements done? Because Ritchie Street is missing a bunch. Um, corner of Camden Avenue and Ohio Street is missing the Ohio Street. So I'm telling her to go past the boulevard, and make a right on Ohio Street. And she gets there and she said, I don't see a street sign for Ohio Street. Which one's Ohio Street? I'm like, okay, what's well, the one? Well, how, how do I tell her which one's Ohio Street? I've lived here my whole life. So is there anything we can do to put some Band-Aids in some places until we get... Where, where we're at on our new signs are, uh, we've ordered uh, quite a bit of material here in the last month for manufacturing. You know, we, we manufacture our own street sign posts and mm -hmm. the sign blanks. Um, we've ordered that material, and I'm uh, almost to the point to order vinyl from the sign shop, but I anticipate that being a, a end of summer kind of installation. We can take a look at what's missing, and you know we certainly have some inventory of the old style signs. Mm -hmm. and again, they're just a uh, just a blank black that we put the letters on. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly something we can take a look at it and put the letters up in the interim until we get the new signs up. Maybe, maybe prioritize some of the areas where people are bypassing the uh, the maintenance work up on the hill. Just, you know, Ritchie Street comes to mind at, 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 at um, Fayette and uh, and at Pocahontas, Pocahontas, and then there's a missing one at Fayette and Florida as well. So if you're driving down that street, it's real difficult to know that you're on Fayette Street because I'm outside of the corner where Taylor and Kanawha and Fayette come together. I'm not sure if there's another one that goes Marion. There is one at Marion, but so maybe just a couple areas where there's where we're seeing a lot of traffic um, bypassing, just for people from out of town to kind of figure out where things are. Other questions for Jerry? I did receive a complaint from Alan Hamner today. Uh, it's the first one this month from Alan. <laughs> um, but uh, it's about the railroad tracks again out on Route 20. I don't know what we do about that mess. We've uh, we've contacted the sub uh, lessee of CSX. We've written to CSX. We've written to the Division of Highways of the Department of Transportation, and I don't know that we've ever gotten any response from any of them. Other than CSX, CSX did respond and say that it was not. It was the lease uh, leaseholder's responsibility to. Upgrading that. It's so, bordering on insolvency or whatever. Right? Yeah, so they're not going to point players back and forth. I don't know. There's, I, I, uh, again, there's there's a contact in the state uh, that we have now that uh, Dan and I have talked about we're going to reach out to just to see if we can get them to, to maybe facilitate a, a remedy for it. But I'll know more in another week or so. Yeah. Well, we also need to file with the, uh, I think, the Attorney General, David, that, you know, they only gave us $1,250 back instead of the entire amount of money. Yeah, on the water project. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, I think either you or Tom O'Neill is going to send a, a uh, something to the Attorney General or the Governor that, I mean, that's just unconscionable that they would do something like that. We applied for a water permit. It cost us 7000 bucks, and they've offered to give us twelve fifty of it back, and they didn't really have to do anything. So, five thousand dollar hit to the water board. Let's uh, let's circle the wagons on the railroad tracks and try to get somebody's attention here. Thanks for the flags on Main Street. Looks really nice. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. About the graffiti I told you about on the down there. I have been there for a couple of days. How how can you get that off or whatever? The only way to get that off is to have come up with pressure washing, which I, I asked the monitor when they got time to, to try to get that off. If it doesn't come up with pressure washing, you paint over. That's how is that? Sorry. Graffiti on the wall trail. Oh. On the what? Wall trail. Thank you. How long has that been? Graffiti on the wall. Couple days. Pam told me a couple yeah. days ago. Yeah. Uh, Somebody's there painting some graffiti on the wall trail. Any other questions for Jerry? Thanks, Jerry. Tell the guys we appreciate it. It's been a busy, busy time. Next up is our Finance Administration Director, Amby Jenkins. Amby. 
I've got a really short report too, but I have been busy. <laughs> sure, Andy. <laughs> Andy has not been. <laughs> says that the mayor. Here. That, that boy's getting those minutes down. He got very good. <laughs> so uh, we've had auditors in City Hall this week, and they'll be in City Hall partially next week. So. We We've been busy with them, and this is the audit for the year ending uh, June 30th of 2017. And we're nearing our year end for June 30th, 2018. So we're, right now, Barb and I are cracking the whip at the supervisors, telling them to watch their budgets, um, making them get all their purchases turned in. I'm cutting off their credit cards tomorrow and <laughs> uh, trying to get all that, that done. Yeah, they think we're pretty rough. But. There's a lot to um, budgets when you're dealing with the government for the state of West Virginia. <laughs> um, we held our, um, oh, that reminds me, I want to tell you, we do have a, another budget revision in the packet tonight. I hoped I hadn't been, had to do that again, but we do. We had a flurry of activity with the um, theater grant. And uh, we've turned in a draw for $102,000, but I truly don't think we're going to get that check in by the end of June. So I just want to kind of give you a heads up that we're going to do that budget revision, but <coughs> your balance on hand coming into July is going to be pretty close with that 102 still pending. So we'll have to make notes on the budget um, revision if we get into July and we don't make our balance on hand. We'll talk about that in July, but I want to give you a heads up on it. Um, we've uh, had our first meeting in preparation of the West Virginia Municipal League Board meeting, October the 25th and 26th, and we're seeking out sponsors for that. We're expecting about 30 board members, but that generally generates about 70 people in Buchanan for those couple of days. Um, we are planning also to mail notifications of vacant properties in July. Once we have Vincent review the vacant property list again, we may have some properties that have already received notification and they may be receiving their first invoices. And I am sure you'll probably hear about it first, so I want to give you a warning of that, that we are sending them out and you may hear about those. What, what day are we send them out? We, it'll probably going to be by the time we get to mid-July, I'm going to say probably around 15, 16th in that area. Um, the Planning Commission is going to meet on June the 28th to discuss um, whether to refer a zoning change of three lots on South Canal Street from residential to commercial. And then uh, we've received permission from Citizens Bank and Mike Ross to use their properties to set the fireworks off at on West Main Street and uh, got the permission from Citizens Bank today. And then later on in your budget you're going to have some information about data maps that the attorney will talk to you about and you may have questions for me and then the budget revision. Thanks Andy. Any questions for Amy? Thanks. Appreciate you. Next up is Police Chief May Gregory. What's going on on the police front? You can just step it up. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, just, just, just Cali, Cali's winning this. Uh, I know, I know. Monthly uh, award goes to Cali. Winning is not the right word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do have several things going on on many fronts. Um, uh, obviously, with the uh, two new hires, we are coordinating with the uh, State Police Academy uh, to send our new officers uh, for training. Uh, the next academy is scheduled to begin on August 27th and conclude on December 14th. Uh, my first priority is to begin the application packets, which consists of medical physicals, uh, which I'll be coordinating with them over the next week or so. We do anticipate starting uh, officers uh, McCauley and Kramer, both on July 2nd. Uh, they will shadow uh, myself and Doug Mountain uh, during the daytime. Uh, until they start the academy. Again, hopefully that will be on August 27th. We have coordinated with the captain of training uh, and expressed our uh, desire for two slots. While they can't guarantee that because every agency in West Virginia trains there, they are aware of our intent to apply here. 
Uh, the uh, Coea Policy Review Committee has begun to meet. Uh, we've had two meetings so far. The first meeting was an informational meeting about the accreditation process itself. Uh, the second meeting, which was actually the first working meeting, uh, occurred a couple of weeks ago. Uh, right now, we are working through a list of time-sensitive standards uh, required of, uh, of Coea. Uh, meetings are scheduled to occur at least once a month. However, this month's meeting uh, is uh, requiring two meetings. Uh, we ran out of time uh, at the last meeting. Uh, we are covering uh, about 32 pages of policy on 23 different standards, uh, focusing on uh, property and evidence control, uh, as well as use of force. A very um, uh, high liability and, and uh, very important topics as we focus on those. Again, as we progress throughout the rest of the year, we will uh, work our way through the time sensitive standards. And in 2019, I'll have a secondary plan that I'll bring before the policy review committee to address the rest of the non time sensitive standards. Uh, the Mountain Lakes Drug and Violent Crime Task Force uh, continues to meet. We uh, are currently having uh, board meetings once a month. Uh, as you recall, I was uh, elected the uh, chairman of the board. Uh, during these meetings, the uh, unit coordinator uh, shares uh, report summaries with the board. And I can say from, uh, while I can't give detailed information, uh, I can say from these reports there is quite a bit of good work going on throughout the region. And uh, hopefully there's a lot more to report on as, uh, more specifically as we progress uh, forward. Kind of echoing what uh, Jeff Harvey said, uh, we did participate in the emergency preparedness drill at the Academy School on June 2nd. Uh, I believe it was a very successful drill. Um, a lot of good dialogue uh, grew out of this uh, uh, drill. And again, and this weighs into, and this is something that the uh, Policy Review Committee will uh, address and speak on uh, as we move throughout the rest of this year. Uh, in fact, uh, in December, we have our all hazards plan that we'll be inspecting. Uh, at that time, so hopefully we'll have everything uh, on board. Uh, this uh, move toward uh, adoption of the city annex of the Ocean County EOP is a major step in the right direction to uh, at least establish our foundation uh, for much of the requirements that exist in the all hazard plan, especially as it relates to the NIMS elements. Uh, and then, of course, from there, we'll continue to work with Jeff Harvey to. Uh, to branch out from that foundation and have specific elements as it relates to law enforcement response. Some examples would be civil disturbances, uh, hostage barricade situations, things like that. And then finally, uh, the uh, police department just was recently uh, recognized uh, with the employer's support of the Guard and Reserve uh, with the above and beyond award uh, for our support of the military and the reserve programs. And we're also a nominee for the Freedom Award. As you recall, one of our employees, Josh Wilson, uh, is in the Air Force Reserve, and we work diligently with him uh, in his training schedule, uh, whether it be uh, training weekends, training in the summer, uh, or the times that he's activated uh, to accommodate those uh, uh, requests, and uh, as a result, the, uh, the Guard recognizes what the award. And uh, just one note on the um, Activity reports, uh, you will notice a little bit of a change uh, concerning accidents. Uh, as I address um, different elements of Kalia, this was actually an extension of one of our time sensitive standards that I just worked on. Uh, it's the May 2018 accidents. Uh, one of the clear requirements is to give uh, breakdown details of accident data as well as traffic citation data. We're working on a, uh, an algorithm for the uh, traffic citation report. Uh, however, the um, uh, software solution that we utilize for accidents, which is known as Report Beam, uh, enables us, it has a report wizard and, and enables us to print out these reports. The breakdown of this report uh, gives more details. Uh, if you recall in the general reports, uh, I indicate just strictly how many, report, how many accident reports there are, whether they be uh, just with damage, uh, injuries, and fatalities. Uh, this data breaks it down into uh, time, day of week, uh, intersecting street, manner of collision, investigating officer, and then on my notes, uh, I'm also able to denote uh, which of those had injuries and which of those were alcohol or drug related. 
And so just uh, a little bit uh, as we uh, progress toward CLEA accreditation, some of the good information that we have from these uh, CLEA compliant policies that you'll start seeing differences in, in our reports and information. With that geographical data, you would be able to draw some nexus between problematic areas? Yes, that and that, in fact, that is, uh, uh, as an extension of this spreadsheet, uh, one of the things that Julia wants us to do is uh, regular annual or semi-annual reviews uh, of problem areas, and if there are any identified, what our responses to those would be. If we have two accidents at Marion Street, Camden Avenue in this month. Yep. Well, there's another one at Marion and Fayette. It, it's, 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 you could probably attribute it to the bypassing of, uh, of the hill. Yeah. The, the, the increased, traffic. increased traffic. Yeah, and again, it, uh, instead of focusing on a single month, if you look at trends, like uh, uh, over the several month period, uh, you're all correct. A lot of it can be attributed to increased traffic in that area. Especially people that uh, aren't all that familiar with the back route. That's mm -hmm. correct. And another factor, and I, I found this historically, and this will be interesting as we continue to uh, collect this data, uh, is the, the speed limit on, on Marion Street. If you recall, many years ago, it used to be 25, and now it's 35. And of course, it'll be interesting as we compare, uh, if we have, in fact, identified that as a problem spot, uh, what are some of the contributing factors, such as the mayor. Well, when they see the speed limit 35, they'll go 45. Yeah. That's part of it. It's amazing the speed that you see on Smithfield Street. And how many people blow through that stop sign at heart in Smithfield. It's amazing. That's all I have. Questions for Chief Gregory? Thanks, Matt. Tell all the guys to be safe. That's the most important thing. Next up is City Attorney Tom O'Neill. Tom? I, I'll be even sure. Uh, most of the matters that I have uh, are going to be addressed under. Uh, either the, uh, the consent agenda or strategic <coughs> issues. Um, so your story is is that all your stuff is strategic and these other yeah. people didn't have anything in the more to bring up. Is that what you're telling us? From one lawyer to another, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's well said, Tom. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> uh, spent, uh, uh, so time has been spent on matters that will come before your uh, before your uh, for your attention uh, later in the meeting, and uh, and and other matters that come up uh, with the department uh, department heads and advice uh, and guidance uh, with respect to those. Um, and I'll speak specifically to the data max uh, matter that Andy mentioned when it comes up under strategic issues. Yeah, that's it. Just for that. We'll get you back here in a couple. Correspondence and information. You have several things in your packet. Uh, we've already mentioned it a time or two, but the theater benefit is this Saturday, uh, June 23. Um, I've been helping uh, Bryson uh, Van Nostrand and Erica Cly uh, Kolenich with the uh, program. And one of the things you're going to see, uh, there's the new uh, middle school symphony orchestra group that's going to perform some pieces. There's going to be three or four, eh, six, eight, ten minute uh, vignettes of Buchanan Community Theater from some of their upcoming theatrical works that I think you'll find to be entertaining. But the other thing that we're integrating, uh, some folks like uh, Bob Post and his wife Peggy and Hudson McMurtry, who we uh, met with recently, and his wife Jean, and uh, Neil Roth, who was exceptionally uh, close, good friends, with Gray Barker, uh, who ran the theater from 73 to 80, uh, every 10 or 15 minutes into this two, two and a half hour uh, gig, uh, we're gonna have somebody come up and share five minutes worth of thoughts and memories, uh, reminiscing about the old days in the Colonial Theater. Uh, not only is that a, an appropriate remembrance for them, but it helps draw the rest of the community into the fast approaching 95 year history of the Colonial Theater. So if, if, uh, if you're out there and you want tickets, they're available at Art, uh, Artistry on Main, the Chamber of Commerce office, and at least until 4.30 uh, tomorrow, we sell the tickets here at City Hall too. So uh, please uh, plan on going. What time is that again, Dave? It uh, starts at 7. seven. It should be finished somewhere 9.15 to 9.30. Yeah. 
so it, it'll be a good time. All right. Um, the West Virginia Municipal League Annual Conference is in Morgantown again at the uh, former Radisson, now Marriott, and that's August 7th through 10th. Uh, so if you want to attend that, uh, notify Teresa or Ambie, and we'll uh, get reservations at least. Uh, we're not picking up any tabs relative to hotels or anything like that. Uh, but there is a registration process if you're planning on attending the conference. Um, under Correspondence and Information D3, this is more of a teaser because at July 5's meeting, uh, Jay Holland is, I don't know if he's coming to the 5th or the 19th. It's one of the meetings in July in advance of our Stockard uh, Youth and Community Center Forum that we're having on July 23. The Stockard uh, Board unanimously recommended, and we had everybody there except one member of the board, uh, the option three uh, layout uh, for the proposed multi-use facility. That doesn't mean a whole lot to you all, but uh, we have all of the renderings uh, that were laid out and identified by Jay Holland and Jerry Arnold uh, out front in City Hall, and we'll share that with you in July in greater particularity. We're not ready to uh, buy a building or start construction or anything, but it does create a little buzz uh, as you start looking at uh, layouts. And then lastly, um, this is a really uh, great update. Uh, you know, uh, last summer, uh, Jerry Arnold and uh, Brad Hawkins and I, uh, and I think Jay Holland too, walked uh, Main Street with Doug Gould, who is the state ADA compliance officer. And he observed as we were walking that virtually all of our 16 intersect points, as you think of Main Street and going down Locust, Kanawha, Spring, and Florida Streets, that's four blocks times four intersections, that none of our uh, intersect points were, we thought three or four were in compliance, uh, but Doug found that none of them were completely in compliance. So we started an internal project to bring back to the Consolidated Public Works Board and City Council seeking funding for a project. And it was within a matter of a few weeks after that meeting, uh, Doug Gould called and encouraged us to apply for state monies. And the state has fully funded wow. the complete uh, replacement a redesign of our 16 intersect points downtown. This is about a $200,000 project. Wow. And they will let the bids on July 10, uh, award the bids rather on July 10, with an anticipated completion date uh, in April of 2019. So that's another uh, huge thing for our uh, downtown. You know, one of the things we all have committed to is being as inclusive as a community as we can. <coughs> When you uh, couple the, the re certified retirement community stuff with so many people who are challenged uh, relative to their disabilities to get around, it's, it's just the right thing to do. So more to follow on that. That's all we have under correspondence and information. Next is the consent agenda. And there are six items that uh, are pertinent to our consent agenda including the approval of the minutes to our regular meeting on June 7th. We had two special meetings involving our uh, police officer stuff, one on June 12th, the other on June 18th. Uh, the approval of the building and wiring permits, the approval of the payment of our bills. Uh, there's information about the Kanawha Lounge uh, zoning form that they're required to submit to the Alcohol Beverage uh, Control uh, Commission. Um, there's information relative to Buffalo Wild Wings, a temporary extension of their ABC license for the period from June 29 to August 31. This is those periods of time when they're allowed to serve alcohol out in their outdoor patio areas. There's an extra hoop they got to jump through anymore. And finally, the Buchanan Upshur Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, uh, our own Callie Cronin Sams has resigned from that board. And I believe we will be required, and we'll probably take that up with the July appointments to designate another city rep. Is that right, Andy? 
So if you have someone that might be uh, interested, I think she's already. Kelly, Kelly listed Sarah St. Clair. Yeah, yeah, that's right. She, 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 I did get her email to that effect. So that's it for the consent agenda. That takes us down to our strategic business. We need to and vote. We need a motion to approve. Oh that. yes, we do. Uh, Mr. Skinner. Our motion to approve. Uh, that. Mr. Skinner <laughs> has moved that we approve our consent agenda, and I think I heard Mr. Rigger say a second. Is that no, actually Mary Albaugh? Oh, Mary Albaugh. You sound a lot like Mary Albaugh. You know? <laughs> oh, thank okay. you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? No. Call for the question. All those in favor of approving our consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Now we're down to strategic. Thanks for keeping me straight, Skinner. That's, that's what my job is. It's a good guy. <laughs> and I don't have the sharp elbowed alloy anymore, so we got to pick up the slack. Um, strategic F1, the approval to submit the re recycling grant application that Callie laid out for us a little bit ago. Uh, this is something that I think we did back in 2006, is what she told us. Yes. Yep. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Rieger. Can I have a second to his motion? Second. I have a second by Mr. Thomas. Is there discussion on that motion? Hearing of the need for none, I'll call for that question. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed like sign motion carries. F2 under strategic is possible vote to submit the pet safe bark for your park you just can't make this stuff up, can you, Jerry? Arnold? He's back there. Yeah. The possible vote to submit the pet safe bark for your park grant application, and this pertains to our dog park maintenance program. And uh, Callie is hopeful that she'll have that ready to go by the deadline of June 30th. So I would entertain a motion that we submit that out. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Second. Thomas. I have a second by Mrs. Albaugh. Discussion on the motion. No. Call for the question. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign, motion carries. Are you keeping up with this, Mr. Rickard? I am. Oh, you're taking, okay. I'm going to double check you here in a little bit. Do it. Uh, F3. <laughs> Approval of resolution 2018 10, pertinent to our general fund. This would be our seventh budget revision. Ambie's earning her keep. She's drumming up these budget revisions for us. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about that, Andy? Um, like I said, it's uh, from the uh, expenses theater. for the theater. Moving but money around, correct? Basically, that's what it is to yeah. keep you all out of trouble. <laughs> this one of those things we have to sign. Understand, yeah. there it is, yes. What we, uh, when we were successful in that state grant for $102,000 last year, uh, there was some matching things that uh, we had to do, like uh, Art 26201 raised money, and we had some other uh, gifts independent of that. But we were supposed to, before we are considered seriously for Phase 1B of uh, what we're trying to get from the state of West Virginia, we had to show that we were spending Phase 1A. So we had till June 30th without applying for an extension to spend that, and we have spent it. So we, we believe in the preliminary submittal that Bryson Van Noos and our architect has already made looks good. They've, they've said, yeah, this looks fine. We'll get back to you if we have any more questions. But they did give it the uh, preliminary once over. Uh, so that's what that is uh, all about. Uh, you heard Amby uh, speak favorably about approving this budget revision. I'd entertain a motion that we uh, do this. I have a motion by Mrs. Albaugh and a second by Mr. Rylands. Is there discussion on that motion? I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries. This is a, a resolution that requires a roll call vote, just so we're clear. Mrs. Albaugh, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Skinner? Yes. Mr. Rieger? Yes. Mr. Rylands? Yes. Uh, Council Lady Caperi? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. And the mayor votes uh, yes. Ordinance 425, uh, property exchange with St. Joseph's Hospital. This is the second and uh, final reading of this ordinance. And we'll call upon our city attorney, Tom O'Neill, to read it by caption and remind us what this is all about. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for the council's benefit, um, this ordinance, uh, well, I'll read it by caption first. Ordinance number 425 of the City of Buchanan 
an ordinance approving the city's conveyance to St. Joseph's Hospital of Buchanan Incorporated of two certain 12 foot wide alleys running between West Main Street and Franklin Street, which are known as Van Camp Lane and Bosley Lane, in trade and exchange for that certain lot tractor parcel of land containing 8,142.9 square feet or approximately 0 0.187 acres, more or less, necessary to facilitate widening of a public street, all of said real estate being situated in the Corporation District of Upshur County, West Virginia. So the, uh, in exchange for uh, a grant by the city of these uh, those two alleys, uh, St. Joseph's Hospital is conveying uh, uh, about a little more than a little just under two tenths of an acre uh, to widen Fike Lane and to make that a full city street. Uh, there is the, this is already passed on first reading. Uh, this uh, I have prepared an inter-parties deed uh, to affect the transaction. It also appears in your packet immediately following the ordinance, uh, which will be which uh, can be executed. 30 days from tonight if uh, council votes to adopt the ordinance. And finally, uh, after the draft deed is a draft resolution of acceptance that would then be acted upon after the deeds were executed uh, sometime early. Uh, uh, well, the, the deeds could be executed uh, 30 days from tonight. The, uh, then the resolution could be taken up, the resolution of acceptance of the the Pike Lane property could be taken up at the August 2nd meeting, and then this would be, uh, this would be all put to that. And just to remind everyone, this, uh, this is a, a partnership project with the hospital. Mm -hmm. They own the uh, property at the bottom of the hill of, uh, near Amelia Drive. They've acquired that in recent years. They want to be able to fully develop it. We've got these three alleys that we don't need three alleys. You know, we've often uh, thought it would be really nice if we just had one good street through there instead of these three alleys that people race up and down on. So this allows us to uh, realize the long desired street while allowing them to maximize the use of that property for a real development at the bottom of that hill, which further makes attractive uh, stuff in our uh, extended downtown. So that's what it's all about. We've approved this on a first reading. I would now entertain a motion that we approve it on second reading. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Thomas. Second. I have a second. I have a second by Mrs. Albaugh. Now is there discussion on the motion? Tom? I'd just like to make one note uh, here that there are, that, that the hospital does not own all of the property that bounds uh, those alleys. And there is a reservation uh, both in the ordinance and the deed of a right of way for individuals who own property immediately adjacent to those lanes to be able to have ingress and egress. Mm -hmm. So um, if, for instance, the, the hospital were to acquire additional parcels adjacent to those alleys, then uh, their absolute ownership of the alley, uh, that those, those rights of way reserved to the owners of the adjacent parcels would then merge uh, into the rights of, own, would, would merge in with the rights of, uh, of the hospital. So I just want to be clear that for people who, you know, for people who may use part of those alleys to access their own property, they can, they'll still be able to do so as long as they own that property. But on portions of the alley where it is uh, owned by the hospital on both sides, they'll be able to close that portion. Sure. I, I can tell you, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. I've spoken with uh, Skip Joelberg two or three times in the last two weeks, and they are negotiating the purchase of those properties. Okay. Nothing to report yet about it, but we've got it covered either way. Okay. Dennis, you had a question about this? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm confused as to where this, uh, what is it called, FICA lane is? It's not, I don't even think it's... Uh, well, it's, park, on, it, it's it? on the assessor. It's called Fike Lane on the assessor's yeah. maps. Is it a paper alley? One of them is a paper it's, alley, Jerry? It's the no, furthest no, one closest to CVS. Yeah, yeah. CVS alley. Yeah. Is it the one that runs down the side of CVS? Yes. Can yeah. be widened? Yeah. Okay, thank you. It will go from 12 or 16 feet 12. to 
two more 12s, right? It would be basically a 36 wide street instead of a 12 foot wide alley. Thank full, you. full blown street. We'll probably put sidewalks and everything else eventually, right? Is that a fair statement? Okay, so uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on the motion? I'm going to call for the question. All those in favor of approving ordinance number 425 on second and final reading, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign, motion carries. Planning Commission, uh, possible recommendation uh, changing the uh, zoning of one armory road from C2 to the industrial district. Um, you know our Planning Commission, it's uh, been meticulously covered by our uh, reporters with the record Della about the uh, hemp plant that is coming to Buchanan. And part of the building wherein this industrial operation will occur is, in fact, zoned industrial. However, the front part of the building that is closest to Route 20, about half of this total complex is uh, zoned uh, highway commercial. So the, uh, the point of the matter is, is they want to be able to avail the entire facility relative to their industrial operation. And the Planning Commission just earlier this week made a recommendation to the City Council that uh, we declare this rezoning and instruct the City Attorney to prepare the necessary ordinance, replete with another public hearing, uh, so you know what that's about. So I would entertain a motion that we accept the recommendation of the Planning Commission and refer this matter to our City Attorney for development of the authorizing ordinance. May I have a motion to that effect? Second. Mrs. Albaugh has made the motion. May I have a second to that motion? Second. I have a second by Mr. Rylands. Is there discussion on the motion? I would just like to point out quickly that um, among the members of the community who uh, you know, expressed some concern about this, this approval of changing the zone in no way, shape, or form, uh, whether it, 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 if this would not be to be approved, it does not change the fact that this business is here. They're working on the property. Uh, my office is across the street from the property, um, so they're they're there each day. Um, this this is this does has nothing to do with this business's uh, investment in our in our community. This is this is a formality change to make their lives easier from a business standpoint. It, this does not change their investment here. That's correct. That's right. That's why I understand it as well. Yeah. Any further discussion on the motion? I'm going to call for the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Takes us down to F6. And Tom, you're still at the, uh, at the pulpit. <laughs> Reach the top. Uh, I couldn't resist. You don't want me at pulpit, so I'll <laughs> right to silly. You want to tell us about uh, this agreement with uh, Datamax? Sure. We actually heard a little bit about last time. Yeah, the and the uh, the agreement uh, is a Datamax form agreement. Um, it uh, it is. It's in full compliance with the representations that were made by the Dave Max representative at their last meeting. It's essentially a one-page agreement. Um, I have drafted an addendum to that, um, which uh, I've emailed to I've emailed to you and to Amby. Um, and the uh, the addendum clarifies that. Uh, Datamax would act as an agent of the city of Buchanan within the meaning of um, state code relative to the confidentiality of BNO tax information. That the confidentiality of any information that they would receive as an agent of the city in carrying out provisions of this agreement would uh, survive the life of the contract in perpetuity. And so that uh, therefore, that protects us from uh, any you know, potential problems with the tax commissioner uh, relative to um, relative to uh, you know confidential BNO tax information being released on authorized parties. But 20 years or so ago, 
uh, about, it might be 25 or it might be 18, but it's been a number of years. I drafted a uh, resolution uh, insisted upon by the state that as we shared our own internal tax records of taxpayers, that we could access things that the state of West Virginia had. And in the process of sharing that information back and forth, I think the uh, mayor and the treasurer or the city players that were limited in being able to review that information. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Thomas, in his 14 years now as city council member, he, he, it's like, hey, I, I'd like to know what, and we, we, yeah. we couldn't tell him no. because right. it was strictly, so now we have this agent that we're hiring to help us in a tax matter, and as they potentially become privy, uh, as allowed by the state, to some of that information, they got to sort of swear on a stack of Bibles that they're not going to share that information either. Yep. That's sort of what it comes down to. That's right. And this would, you know, and, and that's the agreement provides for confidentiality, but I wanted to, I wanted to turn that dial up to 11 and make sure that, you know, we didn't, you know, that, that this addendum clarifies that it puts them on notice that there is state law governing the confidentiality of this record that they have a responsibility of familiarizing themselves with that law and complying with it in perpetuity, right. not just as long as the agreement may be in it. We may not be doing any business with Datamax 18 months from now, right. maybe. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, the agreement would be terminated under its own terms. But that confidentiality provision will remain in force. And Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the <coughs> tax department urged us to make that very clear with this That's agent, correct. isn't that I've right? Talked to Gary okay. at the state tax department. So the the motion that would be appropriate for our consideration would be to approve <coughs> the data max agreement and authorize uh, myself and any other appropriate city representatives to sign off on the agreement. I would entertain a motion it, with the caveat that data max signs off on the addendum. Yes. If data max will not sign the addendum. I would recommend that we not sign. Okay. The paper. You, you heard the added, uh, the addendum to the motion. Uh, I'd, I'd entertain a motion that I'd be authorized to sign that agreement on behalf of the city. So I have a motion by Mr. Rieger. Might I have a second to his motion? I'll second it, but I want to have some discussion. I have a second by Mr. Skinner. Now is there discussion on the motion? <coughs> on the table? Yes. Mr. Skinner. Uh, Amby, I was in your office earlier in the week and we were talking about this a little bit. I wanted to follow up. Did you have a chance to get a hold of Hurricane or Ripley or some of these cities that are similar size to us and their experience so far? Yeah, the ones I could contact, I'll, I'll tell you the ones I did contact. Um, Bluefield, which is larger, um, we're familiar with the similar uh, service that was provided several years ago when uh, Municipal League had this uh, service offered. And they said data messages started with them, but they're very satisfied with it. Hurricane has done well. It's done well for them. They've collected several thousand dollars. Um, they do their home, DM does their homework and their research, and they've not received any complaints from any other businesses or any other vendors. Fayetteville, since, they've been with them since May, and they collected $18,000 for them. Uh, they're pleased with the service. They can always be reached. Uh, DM provides reports for verification of businesses before they contact them, and they've not received any complaints. Milton, happy with DM, and they identify vendors that sell directly to businesses. Those are the ones I were able to get hold of. Okay. One, one other thing I'd add, Robbie, uh, I think we're the only city in the state of West Virginia that has the $1 million yeah. exemption. And that will apply to all of these vendors. Right. And so I if they don't the have a million. Right. I, I forgot St. Albans also got hold of them and they, they were happy with the Because that was my second side of the question is, you know, we don't want to hurt relationships. Right. You know, we don't okay. want, and we also don't want, you know, it, as, as Andy said, Walmart almost expects this. They're to, the, they're to the attitude to where, well, yeah, you guys should have been doing this all along. Every city should be doing this all along. My concern is for people 
that are you know, that would be like for CJ Maggie's and for number one auto sales and, and businesses that are you know large enough to probably get some some volume of their parts and some services that they're purchasing off of uh, out of state and out of town vendors. I don't I don't want to hurt those relationships and cause these smaller businesses to have to then turn around and increase their prices on our patrons because um, that. Oh, that then overall hurts the morale of the community uh, and how we're perceived if this is, oh gosh, you go to Buchanan and everything's higher because we entered into an agreement like this. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just speaking as some of the thoughts I've had over the last couple of weeks after the, after the presentation. I was intrigued by the presentation, but I, being in a relationship business, I, I, I wonder I don't want to hurt long-standing relationships with vendors that businesses have used for quite some time. And I'm not really speaking about, again, Walmart or Lowe's. I'm more speaking about our businesses that are local and really integral to the heartbeat of, of Buchanan. And a question I, I presented to my prime vendor that if I buy food and groceries from a company that's in Pittsburgh and that is supposed to be there's there they are supposed to be paying B&O tax because that sale happened here or the goods were delivered I had always explained that if the sale point of sale is here that's where the B&O develops but I guess they researched the ordinances and they identify who should be paying that may not be paying right well I asked them I said what's the case and they said they just added to to the bill of the yeah. customer and they in have that a million dollar exemption so you know they but it's not it's for for them and their gross so of if more other they sell other things it's it's their aggregate that's sales right. within that municipality that's correct that's right, that's right. so if they had two million dollars worth of sales they the first million, million would be exempt but the other million although they would, they they're not really tax. retail they're wholesale so i don't is that there's a different fee for myself. Different rate, but it's covered. still yes. covered by the exemption. Yeah. Yeah. So but, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we may be increasing the costs of doing business within the municipality that further differentiates us or a level of attractiveness to somebody potentially locating here. But uh, well, one of the one of the, the areas that. Uh, <coughs> When they made the presentation, I, I got a couple issues. Um, one, I, I question why Data Max is even making a presentation to the, the city since we have the uh, million dollar exemption. I don't think they're going to see nearly the payback for their investment that they would have if, if it were not the million dollar exemption. And with regard to what both uh, Robbie and CJ said, um, I'm of the opinion we ought to table it for a while until, you know, uh, we know as a city council that with what we're facing uh, over the next X amount of years that we're going to have to take a review of our revenues and our uh, expenses and that there may be some changes. Who knows what they're going to be, but I think the mayor uh, is going to put a committee together to review that. I would rather sort of have a timing element involved in this whole process because I think Robbie, when he said the relationships that we have with uh, the different businesses and potential vendors in our community, uh, that's something we be, need to be aware of. I think one area that's going to be impacted is going to be the college. You know, you have a, a food service vendor there that has a pretty substantial revenue stream uh, coming into their operation. The Latin already pays a B&O. They do pay a B&O. They did. But the I'm people so selling the food to a Latin, they, they, they do not. Do not. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think so that, isn't that form of double taxation? I mean... I, I feel uncomfortable with it right now myself, yeah. okay? I, David, I think with this committee or whatever you're going to recommend at some point in time, yeah. I think that's part of the timing element that we'll look at. And this, I, I wouldn't... I'm going to vote against this right now. Well, let's put it this way. Um, we... we, we the committee that we're going to take action on here in just a little bit uh, will be looking at six or eight different possible revenue streams. Right. We've talked about first due fire fees, 
we've talked about storm sewer fees, we've talked about some model of a sales tax, now we're talking about the data max thing. There, there is, uh, there's no rush on this. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I'm hopeful that our committee will be able to make some recommendations back to the council within a couple of three city council meetings, and maybe by the time we get to August or September at the latest, we'll have some you know, pretty firm ideas to share with the entire council. Can I make a motion that we... we well, we got a motion on the table to, uh, that we're discussing, but uh, we could amend that. I'd like to make a motion to amend it that we, we table this and refer it back to this committee that you're going to uh, put together for review of our revenue streams and expense streams and okay. ask them to be uh, making a recommendation and also with data max. Okay, relative to the motion that is on the table that we have discussed, Mr. Thomas has now made a motion to table that matter uh, pending the uh, committee's a sharing of information with the entire group. I'll second it. I'll, I'll, I'll be clear. I, I seconded the motion to get it as a discussion because I have reservations about okay. this as well. So I agree with Mr. Thomas. I wanted to get some discussion out there to, to kind of see where we were. And sure. um, so I will second Mr. Thomas's motion because I, I agree with Mr. him. Mr. Thomas has made a motion to table the data, data max uh, agreement for now. That motion has been seconded by Mr. Skinner. Is there discussion on that motion? Hearing of the need for none, I will call for the question. All those in favor of tabling the data max matter for now, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. We'll uh, put it back on the agenda after the at the time that the committee makes its recommendations back to the council. Okay, That's takes us down like to F7 which is the approval of designation of council member C.J. Rylands as our city representative to both the Upshur County Development Authority, uh, the general body, as well as to its executive committee. So moved. Well, let, let me... <laughs> <laughs> Man, that, might have been, that was second. a very fast motion and second. Um, uh, under, under the charter of the Upshur County Development Authority, the mayor is supposed to be the person to act in both of those steps. Uh, eight, nine months out of the year, uh, I teach on Wednesday mornings. And it's, uh, it's, been, it's, it's nearly impossible for me to get to those meetings uh, most of the time. And I don't want to be jumping into something a couple of three times a year when somebody else should be there. So we have the opportunity to designate uh, someone instead of the mayor Mr. Rylands has agreed to do this because he's already a member of the Board of Directors, so he's just going to segue into being the city rep. So, Mr. Thomas, I think you've made a motion to, uh, and Mrs. Albaugh has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion on that motion? Here, here. I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. Motion. As Mr. Thomas alluded to, uh, I am requesting that the council designate and appoint tonight a revenue review committee for our general fund. We started to call this a couple of meetings ago, uh, being completely uh, open, honest, transparent, all those great adjectives, a revenue enhancement committee. However, as we manage our revenues, this body might also look at uh, the expenditure side of things, and we, they could come to, uh, this committee could come to some conclusions that uh, we could better manage some of our expenditures and that we don't need to raise new revenues. We don't need to enhance revenues. So it's a revenue review committee, and the committee that I'm proposing would be uh, J. David Thomas, uh, Mr. Rylands, um, Amby Jenkins, Barb Helmick Hinkle and the committee will be chaired by myself. Um, if we get any bigger with the council members on it, then we have we have to treat it as a public meeting, and every time we have a meeting, we'd have to post it to, <laughs> because then we'd have more people than not uh, on the council on the committee. So it's not intended. It's still going to be a public meeting, 
but we don't need to go through all the stuff of posting it and giving three-day notice and all this other kind of thing. It's and just there, a there may be a time where you want to even have a town hall meeting. Oh yeah, we're not. This this committee will make this committee, as I anticipate, after we have a first session, uh, the, the, they will have a continuous dialogue and exchange with the full council. And before the full council will consider anything, we'll have a big old uh, public discussion about uh, what we're talking about doing. This isn't something that's going to happen in a matter of you know a couple of weeks. I'll never I, use the word enhancement again. Yeah, don't use the word enhancement. It's just, we're just going to review. But we, in fact, we know that our general fund uh, budget has been relatively stagnant for about four or five years. Uh, we've been between 4.2 and 4.5 million. It kind of goes up and down a little bit. But we haven't seen any uh, terrific expansion in the general fund budget for a number of years. And our expenses in the general fund budget and the expectations of our community to do projects continues to increase. So we, we, have, uh, we have been challenged and we have struggled to uh, be able to do everything that we want to do. Um, and I, I could, just to rattle off a few things, we talked after uh, vandalism acts at the River Trail, at the North Buchanan Riverfront Park, in Jawbone Park, at the City Park on Park Street. We've had, let's go out and buy cameras. The police department has a really good high resolution camera. Well, how much did that camera got? Oh, fifteen hundred dollars. Well, how many do we need? Well, we need about ten or twelve of those. Well, where are we going to get that fifteen, twenty thousand dollars? We're operating on a shoestring with our general fund budget. Um, we owe right now because we committed to it last year. We're a hundred thousand dollars behind in our 2017-2018 allocation to the sanitary board to execute storm sewer functions. And it's gonna be the same thing this next year. So pretty soon we're gonna be $200,000 in the hole from what we're supposed to be paying the sanitary board for that. Um, this stuff starts adding up. Let's do some more playground equipment at such and such a, where are we gonna get that? Um, the police department is hiring a new, an extra police officer and there's about a $58,000 expenditure associated with that that we're managing to limp through the first year but after that where's that money going to come from you start adding it up and pretty soon you've got several hundred thousands of dollars a year on basic things that we want to be able to do to continue to turn that dial in the direction of having a, a very positively minded high quality of life community so that's what this is about is there any discussion on the committee idea? Have I entertained a motion yet that we do this? Do we have a motion and a second? Is there any further discussion on the motion? Then I'm going to call for the question. All those in favor of designating this committee, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion. Is there a second? Who made the motion? Who made the motion? Who seconded it? Mary made the motion. Mary made the motion. If I'll second it if we need a second. Yeah, I, I was thinking Skinner seconded it. Oh, sure. <laughs> so, 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 to be, so, we're, so we're being entirely uh, parliamentarily uh, correct. Elbowing. We had a motion by Albaugh and a second by Skinner. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Call for the question. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign, motion carries. Takes us down to F9. <clears throat> discussion, possible vote, regarding residential parking designations around West Virginia Wesleyan College. In April, uh, residents of College Avenue, Tim Reese and Mike McCauley, came to the Consolidated Public Works Board meeting, uh, observing, and I think uh, correctly observing, that particularly during the day, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the afternoon, there are areas abutting adjacent to the campus proper that it is very difficult for residents in that area to find parking in front of their house. College Avenue, Barber Street, Pocahontas, that neck of the woods that you might think of as being just south of the campus proper, on the other side of Mead Street primarily. Um, we asked for the Shepherdstown model because they have a similar kind of situation to what we have with a residential community that right in the middle of it is Shepherd University. 
uh, we became aware a number of years ago that Shepard had this parking policy. So we asked for a revised ordinance reflecting it. It was shared with the members of the Consolidated Public Works Board. And at the May meeting, the Consolidated Public Works Board, that includes uh, council members Caperi, Rylands, and myself, agreed to recommend to the city council that the council take a look at this and consider a model that would be similar to the Shepherdstown model that would reserve parking for the residents in those areas close to campus. Uh, this would require us to do some signage. It would require us to issue uh, you know, rear view mirror placards for cars that were parking belonging to the residents in that area. So that's what this is about. This would require uh, Tom O'Neill to consider the Shepherdstown ordinance and to come up with a model similar to what Shepherdstown did that at some point in the next couple of meetings he'd bring back city council for possible uh, action. So, uh, do you want to get a motion on the table and then we can discuss it? I have a motion by Council Lady Capari. You might remember doing this about six, eight years ago, because when I was town attorney, that's when I first got the Shepherdstown Ordinance. Motion by Council Lady Capari. May I have a second to her motion? Second for discussion. I have a second by Mr. Skinner to get the motion on the table. The motion is now on the table. Is there discussion on the motion? Um, can we hear from the neighbors? Well, sure. They're See, back they? again. It's like the okay. it's like the poltergeist movie. They're back, right? Uh, Tim, well, right now, Tim Hayes, you want to speak first? Yes. Right now, up there on all those streets, if you drive by there, you're going to see it looks like the rest of College Avenue, the rest of Pocono Street, the rest all the way down. It looks like that. The minute the school gets back in session, I mean, every single parking space from eight o'clock to five o'clock is taken. Plus, they park in the elephant. They can't squeeze all of them in there. So. Entering driveways or alleys is destroyed. Um, one of the main things is I can't, I don't drive, but people drive me. And they can't they can't come to my house, they can't park. One of my neighbors is elderly, they can't park to get their groceries out. Nobody can get their groceries out. It's, and it's an eight to five thing, seriously. And um, what I was concerned about was when Wesleyan first decided to take out 80-something spaces of parking from the Chapel Oval. We got many reassurances they were going to provide adequate parking. Well, they made parking, but it's not adequate and it's not convenient. The students are apparently too fragile to come from the big parking lots they put pretty far away, but we old people can park many blocks or get away and walk from very far away. <laughs> Me and my... <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Let's limit it to that. Okay. So anyhow, uh, I saw something in the paper the other day. It was yesterday, I think, and it kind of misrepresented things. Is that nobody was allowed to park there except us, and, and uh, there will be events that maybe Wesleyan or something like that. My initial proposal, after considering and talking to many people down through there, was simply this. We can pass these out. It's no parking 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then the weekends, your relatives can come. The, you know, the, the thing about uh, 8 a.m., if people want to park there, if students want to park there at night, I can, oh, yes. <laughs> I can guarantee you they're not going to come over at 8 o'clock. You just got your tax return there. Too. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not going to come at 8 o'clock and remove it. So it's basically, it's a very effective deterrent. Of, of people parking there. Some students park and leave their car there for five, six, seven days at a time and don't move it. People that want to mow their grass there can't do it. On some of those other streets, uh, there's they can't take care of their landscaping. There's a, there's a very big um, loss of motivation to even want to renovate their properties and stuff because you're just blocked in by cars. I don't know if any of you went and looked there during that period of time. I photographed it for eight days to show a complete cycle. And it was other than Saturday evening, a little bit Sunday morning, there was a few opened up, but every day, every single space was taken. So I just wanted to say that it's not, and if we go with that 8 to 5, it's not going to really interfere with Wesleyan's some kind of event at Laurel Hall or anything like that. This basically is a deterrent. It's all just a deterrent, and if we have to do placards or whatever, that's fine. But a few tickets, and they're going to start maybe going over the Wesleyan lots. I did, uh, based upon what I assured you I would do at the May meeting, we did schedule a meeting with uh, Dave Parks, the security director at the college, 
um, Ron Hartley, our physical plant director, uh, John Waltz, uh, our uh, dean of okay. enrollment guy and sort of dean of students, and Elisa Lively. I met with them, and uh, they, they understand the plight of the folks who live on the periphery of campus. They weren't against it. They did ask that if the council was to do this, that they be given a heads up so that they could, you know, assure students that, hey, you could still buy a Westland parking product, right. you know. So, I mean, I, I guess you, you could uh, argue the point that this would actually uh, help the college coffers because kids <laughs> might be more tempted it to might be acquire their got, permits. As long know. as they got a shuttle to take them from that far I, parking I, lot. I, I, I do want to clarify one thing. The spots that were around the chapel, the college tripled, tripled. Three right. times the number of spots. And I said that they did the not as close, but, but it was not convenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, was, when President Barch was here, brought up and she brought up that they had that it was lighted and it was patrolled by campus security. I said, well, why don't we take that over in front of the administration building? Yeah. And we'll make that student parking. We'll put you guys down there in that. Well, that's not yeah. very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, what so, our, that's what a lot of companies do. They tell their employees to park. You know, away from the uh, front door. Right. The and that's, a, that's one last thing I wanted to bring up here. It's not only students, especially things associated with the new Welcome Center. There's a lot of employees that don't want to buy a parking pass. Yeah. Their right. Right. Yeah. 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 And there's some, you know, quite a few parking spaces. There. Yeah. 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 So anyhow, those of us that live there, we'd like to be able to unload our groceries. We'd like to have our friends and family come to visit with not, them not having to bar two blocks away and carry the gifts they're bringing me out. Tom, I'm going to draw you into the discussion. Do you, do you think that based upon Tim's presentation and the Shepherdstown ordinance that we've uh, got, do you have enough information that we can work on uh, if the council instructs you to do that, that we got something we can start to put together for consideration? Yeah, yeah there's no question. I mean, the parking, uh, you know, we just amend it into our parking ordinance yeah. and designate you know certain streets and certain blocks to blocks to be residential parking only. Now the question becomes enforcement uh, and are we going to require residents to you know obtain you know some kind of permit that they have to display in their window oh, at that point. So. I mean enforcement is another you know right. it's another issue right. on this. And then what about visitors you know that are non student you know it's it's yeah. very difficult to we can work it out, but it's not as quite as cut and dry as right. I, I would I would also some folks have said, well, you know, depending upon what St. Joe's does with that property at the bottom of the hill, that could create an issue. And there's issues up there at Buchanan Academy School sometimes. Well, if we do this the right way, it's just a matter of amending the ordinance to expand. There there may be other zones that would come to. It's not just pick on the college kids. Right. There could be other areas where we're trying to favor people being able to park by their house other than just at the college. Right. So you got so church, say you got there was churches. more we wanted to add uh, other areas. Is this, <clears throat> would this be, you know, the college avenue zone, one zone? Something and then, like that. But might be the hospital zone and the that, Buchanan that Academy pretty complicated. Zone. Well, I don't, I don't know that you need to do it as a zone. I think you could just designate certain streets yeah. As residential parking only, and and those the be people that own property or live in rental property on those streets would be given a placard yeah. pass in their car. Yeah. You know, if you, Tom, as you know, I mean, you go to Charleston, and on the the further you get down the East End on Courier and and Virginia Street East, the closer you get to the capital, you start seeing signs that say. With resident, you know, permit parking only re by resident because yeah. they don't want capital employees and capital visitors right. coming back into the re into the neighborhoods and then walking over. So, I mean, it, it a lot of cities have this. Yeah. And, and I may one more thing. Sure. The uh, as far as uh, apartments and uh, uh, houses that are converted to apartments, I think in the Shepherdstown, when their their ordinance said that uh, these places had to provide their own off street parking and anything was grandfathered in that was apartments prior to that date. Yeah. If someone takes a house and turns it into an apartment after we have our ordinance, which also says you have to have off-street parking, then those people are required to have the off-street parking and not eligible for parking permits. So 
if a house puts in uh, four apartments in one house and there's eight people in there, that's eight cars. And they don't get eight placards. No, they, I'm saying maybe one per gas, one per get, uh, water bill in these in the apartment things, one per water bill. And then if it's a family in a house, maybe they can have two. But you know, you can work that. That's the details of the ordinance. But uh, but uh, you know, if someone puts in like I, I know something's going in there at the corner of college, and they're going to put a bunch of students in there, and I talked to them, I said, oh, I hope you're putting the parking out back. Yeah. So well, you know, that could potentially be 16 students in there that would, we, we wouldn't have any part. Well, to be clear, I, I, I don't want to throw Katie under the bus because she asked me questions. Do you see any issues with this? And I said, well, yeah, there's some complexities that sure, we'd yes, have to navigate and work through. And I thought that that right there was the simplest thing I could think of. And it's, it's basically a very effective deterrent. And I think with a period of a couple of years, the parking problem will problem after a few days. Oh, it changes <clears throat> fix itself. Change, changing human behavior yes. is what it's all about. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and we've had plenty of discussion. Is there any further discussion on the motion? I just would like to thank him for the research yeah, and, for, and for bringing this to us because, I mean, it makes sense to me. So, so. To, to clarify, the motion is to allow the city attorney to begin drafting right. yeah, the order. Yeah, so, yeah so, we're not, we're okay. not doing anything tonight other than authorizing the drafting of an ordinance, which We'll give us another month to think about it. Right. Okay. And Tom will come we'll back tonight, a couple yeah. of meetings or something, and we'll we'll hash it out. Mike? I'd just like to add that we're talking, you know, it's like nine months long, Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. It's yeah. a long period to go through with it. Yeah, May, June, July is no problem. It's yeah. When yeah. they start coming back. Well, it looks August. like everybody else's neighborhood, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I often wondered, all those people that park there, and I, I think it's probably 50, 50 students and staff. Yeah. You know, because I see a lot of people walking to the Welcome Center and walking to those houses on Mead Street and Preston College. A lot of fraternity boys are doing. Oh, yeah. Those yeah, guys they drive from Kanawha Street yeah. down to the college. To and I've often wondered, it's like, they probably left their house, they probably walked out of their house and parked, got to their car real close to their house and drove here. And then when they go home, they park real close to their house again. I have seen students of mine uh, that live in Camden Apartments get in their car in the back lot and drive to the baseball field. Now, yep. these, are, these are student athletes. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, oh my God, that's two blocks. Well, they have a band. Band. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get it. I know. I know what you're saying. I don't get it. but uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I understand their problem. I'm an old fuddy-duddy. I walked a mile and a half when I was in college. Yeah. And five foot snow uh, drifts, you know? Up the hill. Up the hill. Walk, up the hill. Up the hill. Way. In July. No Three feet of snow. <laughs> Without a pair of shoes. <laughs> and you're the one who wants to drive a fire truck? Yeah. <laughs> I'm still working on JB with that. We'll we, we still have a motion on the table. If we don't have any further discussion, I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign motion. It carries. Okay, uh, it takes us down to the last strategic matter. Can you guys believe this is on? I think we should talk about. Um, we have, uh, and I will have Teresa send this to everyone. Uh, we have uh, a couple of vacancies on historic landmarks. Uh, I am going to make a proposal at the July 5 meeting in the spirit of transparency. Uh, I, I am going to propose that we make some changes to our planning commission to reduce the number of commissioners from 15 to 9. And I also have uh, some folks that I uh, have tentatively gotten approval to nominate them for service on our planning commission. I also want to take our committee that Mary Albaugh has chaired for the past year and a half which is our uh, Veterans Affairs Committee, and I would like to make that a full-blown Veterans Affairs Council, and that uh, the, some of the complaints that we've heard relative to things like what Larry Brown has raised with uh, the Veterans uh, Wing of the Cemetery, uh, Jerry and I have previously uh, proposed to the VFW and we would also propose to the American Legion the creation of a veterans loop up there off of Kanawha Street. Uh, just all kinds of things that impact our uh, veterans. The annual Memorial Day uh, stuff and Flag Day and featuring them in the 4th of July stuff and Veterans Day and uh, trying to help facilitate getting veterans uh, before 
folks in the school system, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so that's something new. It's, it's not, the function of the committee really won't change, but uh, just expanded authority, and, and I'm going to propose that Mary be the chair of that. Uh, and she's agreed that as part of that, she would step away from the planning commission. Gladly. And oh. I, Mr. Oh, Rylands, I know veterans. <laughs> Mr. Rylands has agreed, if it's the will of the council, to return to the planning commission. That Man, you're just signing CG up for everything tonight. Well, he's a. Uh, yeah. I think there's opening on historic uh, landmarks. There is. I'm already there. <laughs> on historic landmarks. And, and I, if you got if you got somebody in mind for that. Uh, I, I, I did mention to Mr. Rigger that since uh, his folks have that beautiful place right oh, beside yeah. City Hall, that his if one of retired. them wanted to <clears throat> serve on it, your mom said she would do that. Yep. So oh. there, there we go. Charlie would be good. But, but, but there are a couple other holes, openings here and there on some of our many, many committees and boards and things. So I'll have Teresa shoot that out to everybody in advance. But the first meeting in July is usually when we act on that. So don't wait till July 4 to say, hey, I got somebody, because chances are we've already talked to somebody else. But uh, I'll get Teresa to send out all of those appointments, and if you see somebody that's a blank line and you want them, you give me a shout and we'll, we'll try to plug them in. All right? That's all I got. We don't need to take action on that this evening. Takes us down to council comments and announcements. And first up is Mrs. Albaugh. Mary, what do you got for us? Um, thank, and I want to say thank you for... Um, putting me on the planning commission. Sure. Uh, I, I, I did learn a lot. And then thank you for taking on taking me yes. on. Right? <laughs> um, because you know if you if you work well with something and you work it all the time, sometimes it's um, I'm excited about this. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. A lot. Um, anyways, the um, the other thing is just went right over my head. It was very important. Yeah, there it's all there. Good. Apparently not. Yeah, it was. July <laughs> 6th, there's Pam going to talk about that. No, that's Pam's do. Pam's talking about that. Uh, oh, I know what it was. This. The Sharpaliski's mother's letter about the colonial. Yeah. I forgot to bring you Bob's memory, so I'll drop it off here tomorrow. Okay. For you. We're going to make that part of our next message, but Bob, uh, so you know, Bob and Peggy Post. Yeah. And the McCurt McMurtrys, McMurtrys, okay. and uh, uh, Neil Ross, they're all coming. Right. So, and and right. Mike Sharpaliski's mom did a beautiful uh, letter back uh, in 2008 about the Colonial Theater and Garland West and Tex Ritter when he was uh, in town, who happens to be my great uncle, Tex Ritter. I just want to throw that out. To, you, know, you are dealing with somebody who's got celebrity connections. <laughs> So anyway, Ooh, who's Tex Ritter? Yeah. Who's Tex Ritter? On? He's an American country music singer, uh, he's popular actor from the 1930s. Chain. Don't 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 be suckered in by Tom. Was he a high noon? Was he high? Did he sing? He was high, high noon. Did yeah. sing high noon. I'm he'll, reading his song. Yeah, I remember that. Hillbilly Heaven and so many other. But she's got this great letter where she talks about Tex Ritter staying with the Wests, stayed in their house, and he popped a button off of a coat, and she sewed it back on, and it's just a really. We think it's going to be a very special uh, night. So please come out on the 23rd. That's this Saturday, just 48 hours from now. Well, you want to come lower or not, it might be over, huh? Okay. Uh, anything else, Mary? Uh, no, I, I'm going to purchase a ticket. And if anybody wants a ticket to the play, I'd be glad to donate it to someone who wants to go. But I can't go. I'm going to be there, but I have to leave. Okay. I'll take a free ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one. Pam, prepare. Standard millennial. What do you got for me? I'm just looking for volunteers for the 4th of July event on July 6th. Um, uh, I want to thank Mr. Kozad again for getting us $1,000 from Manic Coast Pipeline. And some other monies are supposed to be coming in. Um, also, um, I just want to let you know I'm going to be in the show Saturday. Uh, wow. <laughs> and uh, this, I'm in the. Uh, Don't tell us, man. The play. <laughs> You'll be available for autographs. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, we'll be but, uh, you better sign mine now then. Oh. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it'll be a good event, an annual event. I'm excited about it. Yeah. So, Super. Uh, Anything else, Pam? No. Nah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rylands, you're next up. Uh, I think some of these uh, deliberative conversations we've had not only at council but in the, in the community public meetings that sometimes they 
can uh, be a little dramatic and uh, uh, tense, but out of those moments come forward movement and forward steps. So anytime we can sit down with other people and have a deliberative conversation about critical issues, sometimes the people are very, uh, have strong opinions about, the positive things come out of that. And, and when you have open, uh, honest conversations and, uh, you know, things are shared, you know, accountability through disclosure of the facts. And once everyone has all the facts and you, you're looking at people, you know, in the face, these things can all help us move forward. So just remember that when you're in the midst of a uh, dramatic uh, conversation or presentation if you're getting heckled and whatnot and uh, give them a smirk and a thumbs up and we're going to move forward one way or the other so that's it. Anything else? Mr. Skinner. Well that kind of I kind of changes my remarks a little bit. Uh, um, Great minds think alike. Goodness. Well, so I'll, I'll be a little bit more deliberate than CJ. I was at the, the community forum this week um, about the needle exchange program. And I have to say, looking back at it, um, I'm really, really concerned about how divisive we are as a community about this issue. Um, we left there with no way forward as of this point. And a community can't, a community can't see progress by leaving meetings with no solution and no way of a solution, in nothing solution oriented in the near future and in sight. Um, you know, it, I've penned letters and I've talked to Katie a lot about, and I've talked to a lot of people about this issue, and um, I, I would like to publicly say again to the members of the health board to please consider tabling this program and for, for a while until we as a community can come together and figure out what the best way forward is to combat this issue. This is a holistic, large issue that this program will not solve. Substance abuse is a major issue, not here, not only here, but in America. And a program that I'm sorry is an enabler is not going to solve it. We have to, as a community, like we've done with a lot of other projects in this community, we have to come together and we have to formulate the best way forward that works for here. And I know it's very easy to look at what's happened elsewhere. I pointed to in my letter what's happened in Charleston. And that's really concerning, um, but I know that we are not Charleston. I get that. But we need to come together and figure out how to fit, how to work on this together as a community here. And so I'm, I asked the health board to consider, they asked everyone in the meeting to come in there with an open mind. But my observation is, is that the health board equally did not have an open mind. No, they did not. And I believe that we need to all have an open mind and we all need to listen to each other and we need to, as CJ said, to consider the facts and make a decision collectively as a community and this should not be shoved down our throats. Because right now it is. This was voted on in January. It was implemented in May and we had a community forum in June. That's wrong. The transparency is not there. The information wasn't there, and therein lies the issue with why our community is so divided on this issue and how, and how the tempers got out of hand. So that's what I have to say. I, I, I just want us as a community to look for a solution, not be fed a solution, and not be told what a solution is. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Well, I endorse what Robbie said. And I think it was very unprofessional 
the way it was handled from the get-go. And David, you have talked about transparency and accountability. This was a failure, period. And if you talk about potential litigation, you know, there are probably people in this community that may litigate and ask for an overhaul for the whole system. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I think they ought to table and come back to the community with open minds. And um, I could say some more things, but I won't. The, um, I, I, want to, I wasn't able to attend the uh, three o'clock recognition of Sam Ludlow, but uh, I've known Sam for a long time, and he's been a real, real asset to our community. And I just want to thank him for everything he's done for over the years. I also want to thank uh, uh, Kathy uh, Gregg, who is a retired professor from the college in biology. And uh, she's a uh, person that has continued her professionalism and also is a uh, supporter of the community with the, uh, the river trail and the different horticultural things that she's been involved with. That's what makes our community great, is people getting involved and committing their, their time uh, to this community. And I also really am excited about the um, committee that the mayor has appointed for uh, revenue review and expense review. And I, I want to make it clear, especially to uh, uh, the community, that when you hear about that, they're going to start saying, oh my gosh, we're going to see our fees increase or whatever. But, you know, we need to invest in our future. It's very, very important. And whether it's storm drains or uh, the flowers or the police department, the fire department, you know, on and on and on. I was thinking up here tonight, uh, it would sort of be a fantasy for me in some ways. I've been blind for almost 26 years. And it'd be very interesting to come back to the community with a vision for about five minutes to take a look at what is there now compared to 25, 26 years ago. And especially with the Technology Entrepreneurial Center coming in and the Citizens Bank and some of the other things we're doing with St. Joseph's Hospital. It is really an exciting place. And those of you see it every day. Think about what this place was like 25 or 30 years ago and imagine it then and where it's going to be in a couple of years. That's pretty exciting to me. It is. Anything else, Dave? No, that's it. Colin Rieger. What do you got? I'm also <laughs> excited about the Revenue Review <laughs> Committee. We have a lot of great things we're working on and also a lot of issues that we're constantly mitigating in the various sectors of public works and public safety and I think it's really important to make sure that we continue to fund our growth properly because unfunded growth becomes death uh, and stagnation becomes death also. So unless we want to become other cities that surround us that I won't name out loud, uh, we have to make sure that we keep you know, increasing our budget in reasonable ways uh, that work for everybody. Um, so that's about all I have to say. Super. It's just a, a couple of things. Uh, we did have uh, some folks talking about storm sewers at the sanitary board. Jerry mentioned that. Uh, we we got to do better with that, guys. So that's one of the things that the uh, Revenue Review Committee will be looking at. I, I uh, Sam Ludlow is one of the great public servants. Uh, came here 45 years ago to work for the uh, Region 7 Planning and Development Council. It was there from 73 to 80, then it was Kelly Gidley, Blair and Wolf from 80 to 88. During that time, they were our primary consulting engineers. And then Tony Gum, uh, who spoke at Sam's uh, uh, matter today out at the sewer plant, uh, Lord Sam away from Kelly Gidley back in 1988, and he's been with us for 30 years. And Sam's not announcing any retirement or anything. He's uh, cut back. He's a half-time guy. 
I told him that uh, this uh, renaming the sewer plant, his honor, came with the proviso that he was signing on for another 45 years. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Sam's 72, 73, that'd be a pretty good trick if he could pull that one off. But uh, if anybody could, it would be Sam Ludlow. Um, we have been, uh, it's been identified as a pre-award query by the First Energy Foundation concerning the Colonial Theater. We are hopeful that just about any time we're going to receive another nice uh, grant award from the First Energy Foundation. So more to, more to follow on that, but hopefully some excitement soon. And please, if you got uh, your Saturday evening open, you got to come out and see the most recent improvements. Uh, we have the new primary support beam has been completed. The windows are fully restored. The marquees lit back up. The stage has been rebuilt. And uh, the Buchanan Community Theater folks are going to have some special stuff for us uh, Saturday at 7. Please come out. $25 a ticket. It's a fundraiser. Available at City Hall, Artistry on Main, and the Chamber of Commerce. Is there, is there a, a speech about Jim Nord to be there? There will be a presentation made honoring... Uh, there's a, a annual award that's being a cre created. This will be the inaugural one. The Jim mm -hmm. Nord Award will be given. Jim won't be able to be there, but uh, Judy and her kids are, are going to be there, and, and uh, we want to make that special for them, too. So please come out. That's all I have. Uh, I would entertain a motion so to adjourn. <laughs> Ryland's the motion, second Thomas, Thomas the second. <laughs> Any discussion on that motion? No. Uh, no. Nope. 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 Come on. Nope. 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 Nope.